In today's video, I'm going to show you the top three worst tennis tips and explain why these tips will hold you back as a tennis player. So one tip that you've probably heard many times is stay low. And this is a really bad tip because staying low only applies to low balls. So if I get a ball that's very low, for example, a slice, then of course I'm going to stay low in order to perform my stroke, whether that be a volley or a backhand or a forehand. But any ball that's above the waist, staying low would be counterintuitive to your technique. So it makes absolutely zero sense to stay low on a ball that's above your waist. Just think about it. If the ball, let's say, is up here, and if I continue to stay low on a ball like this, uh, this will bring the contact to my head level. That's not what you want on a tennis stroke. Naturally, on a ball that's higher, you are going to get low initially to load your stroke by bending your knees. But then, once you start accelerating the stroke, you need to lift the body up and straighten the leg in order to accommodate the higher contact. Now at the higher level there's a lot of spin being produced and players will very often make contact above their waist because balls with spin have a tendency to bounce higher and so what will happen at the high level is that the contact is made above the waist somewhere between the shoulder and the rib cage. And our players will, of course, lift into these balls. So if you watch high-level players, they very often will lift uh, the dominant leg and the non-dominant leg will go into the air usually. And on some situations, they might even uh, become airborne. So when you're playing, make sure that you are staying low on balls that are below your waist. There's nothing wrong with that. And that is what you should do. However, if you get a ball that's higher, do not stay low, but simply allow your body to lift and accommodate the higher contact. Another tip that you hear very frequently is take your racket back early. And this is very logical. So the ball comes and if we take the racket back early, we have a better chance of timing the ball correctly. But when you observe high level players, you will see that this is not the case. The only professional players that will sometimes take the racket back early are Venus and Serena. And this is only in practice. When you see them uh, play matches, you see this less, but they will indeed uh, take the racket back early. However, all the other players, will not take the racket back early and they will sequence the stroke in the following way. They will be in a ready position observing the incoming ball. And now they're gonna make a turn once they make that observation to either side. And let's assume the ball is coming to my forehand. So as soon as I see it coming to my forehand, I'm gonna to turn towards my forehand side. And now the next step is I'm going to set up the ball. And you can see that my non-dominant hand is still on my racket while I'm setting up the ball. Now, once that ball comes close to me, I'm perfectly set up, then I'm going to initiate the stroke. And the initiation of the forehand begins when that non-dominant arm starts to pull across the body and the racket starts to drop so that once we hit the forward phase, the forehand starts to accelerate really fast. So here's the problem. If you take the racket back early, you're probably going to bypass a couple of steps. So if you see the ball coming to your forehand side and the first thing you do is take your racket back uh, really fast, uh, you're most likely not going to make a turn. You're going to be uh, too open and most likely you're going to be feeling very awkward setting the ball up with the racket already back. See, we don't really move efficiently with one arm being down and the other arm being up. It's more efficient to move like this. This is kind of like a runner's position. See, if we have both hands on this side, this is how sprinters run. And it's very comfortable to set the ball up when both hands are across the body in this way. And the biggest problem with taking your racket back early that you're most likely going to lack swing momentum and rhythm. So if you take the racket back and the racket just sits there, you will have to accelerate it from zero. See, on a regular forehand, we're going to gradually accelerate the racket by dropping it and then going into the forward phase with a lot of momentum. And if you put this in context of the incoming ball, it will make even more sense. So all high-level players will wait until the ball has crossed the net and then it's either about to bounce or already has bounced 
to start initiating the stroke. And just take a look when you watch tennis the next time. And you will see that players, for example, on the forehand, will hold the racket with both hands. And now once the ball has cleared the net, they might start separating the hands, but they still haven't initiated the stroke. So the racket has still hasn't dropped until the ball is close to bouncing. Then they will start dropping the racket and accelerate. And it's exactly this late timing that makes the strokes so effective and so fast. But I know what you're thinking. If you do this method, you're gonna think you're gonna hit the ball late. But quite the opposite is the truth. You can easily hit the ball late if you take your racket back early. And what does it mean to hit the ball late? Well, a late contact would be a contact with the string bed uh, pointing towards the outside and the ball will shoot off uh, to your right if you're right-handed. And this will not happen with this timing because you are going to accelerate very fast. In other words, there's gonna be no time to stop. Uh, there's not gonna be any possibility of developing a hitch in your backswing where you get caught somewhere along the way. But if you wait for the ball to bounce and then you accelerate, you'll have to do it real fast or otherwise you will not be able to hit the ball. And this is what all high level players do. And because the stroke accelerates rather fast, uh, players are very rarely making late contact. So to summarize, the reason why I don't want you to take your racket back early is because you're going to lack swing momentum, you're going to lack rhythm, and most importantly, you're going to develop a hitch in your stroke. And this will not look like a high level stroke. What you should do instead is do the proper sequencing on the stroke, which is you're going to be in a ready position, and then you're going to observe where the ball is coming and as soon as you see it coming uh, for example to your forehand side you're going to make a turn and now you're going to set the ball up perfectly and now you're going to be in the perfect position to strike and when the ball is about to bounce you're going to separate and accelerate and you're going to meet the ball in the right place most of the time and finally the worst tip ever is hit through the ball and this is something that a lot of recreational players do, but you will see no high-level players hitting through the ball. In other words, high-level players will always have a circular rotational swing path on all their strokes. And high-level tennis would not be possible if there wasn't a circular swing path. But what you see from a lot of recreational level players is, for example, a forehand like this. And just picture someone at your local club hitting in this way. This is very common. And players are indeed hitting through the ball on a forehand like this. And the reason is they're not utilizing torso rotation. So in a sideways position like this, if I make contact, I'm almost forced to hit through the ball because my body is blocking the racket. So there's no other path for the racket to go than to go forward through the ball like this. See, the strokes will accelerate really fast and you don't really have to consciously manufacture a circular swing path on your forehand and your backhand. It will happen naturally if you utilize torso rotation. So on the forehand, for example, if I rotate and I have my non-dominant arm lead the way, see, if I continue this rotation, naturally the racket will continue along the same path and I end up with an intuitive circular swim path. It's very unlikely that if I have a full rotation that I'm gonna continue going forward like this this feels very counterintuitive and it's not something that's likely to happen. On the backhand is the same thing. If you're talking about a one-handed backhand, there is torso rotation involved. So players will make a large turn usually with their shoulder blade pointing towards the incoming ball and they will rotate into the contact like this. Now some players will continue to rotate a la Shapovalov theme or Ravrinka and some others like Federer will rotate and then they will hold the sideways position as they finish. Uh, both of these backhands will utilize torso rotation and the arm is simply accompanying this rotation by going in a circular path across the body uh, looking something like this. On a two-handed backhand, there's a larger amount of torso rotation involved and players will make that same type of turn with the shoulder blade pointing towards the incoming ball. And now the rotation will start and contact is made uh, with the non-dominant shoulder slightly behind the dominant shoulder. And then this rotation is continued until uh, the chest is pointing towards the side fence. So you have to utilize torso rotation to develop this intuitive circular swim path. And the advantages you will get 
uh, from such a swim pad is number one you get more feel because you are connecting that ball uh, to your body and it just feels a lot better to do a swim pad like this than doing it the other way where you're disconnecting the ball from the body and going forward and uh, this feels like we're losing the ball another thing you will gain from a circular swim pad is control and powers but by going across the ball like this or on a backhand like this it's far easier to control the ball this way and we also can generate more power in the same fashion because we're connecting the ball to our body we're using our core more it's a lot easier to accelerate the racket this way on the other hand if you are making contact on the forehand for example and you are in a sideways position even if it be a minimal sideways position and you hit through the ball uh, you are forced to push through this ball to gently massage it and a lot of players are aware of this maybe even at the subconscious level and they know that if from a position like this where the body is blocking the circular swim path and you are forced to go forward if you do this too hard uh, there's a big chance that the ball will fly long on you and it's not that you couldn't get power by hitting through the ball you could you could be in a sideways position and swing really fast like this but the chances of the ball going in consistently are almost zero and this is why players that utilize the hitting through the ball style usually don't play with power they gently are massaging the ball and pushing it in so if you want to have a chance to play high level tennis and eventually hit the ball with control and power you must utilize torso rotation so you can get that intuitive circular swim path